Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, David, for those kind words. Um, good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you again, David, the staff, the board, for inviting me tonight to be with you. And the most difficult part of my job was actually to change my hat from a developer, organizer, having to face residents to be on the other side, making policy, actually implementing policies of my legislators and um, looking at housing with a different, in a different way. And I cannot thank enough Governor Lamont for the opportunity that he gave me to be able to impact or to make a better effort statewide uh, through the organization that David mentioned, um, we built affordable housing, homeownership, rentals, we did after school programs. So the work of teams is not new to me because I have been there, I have done it, done a lot of fundraising. So I understand the work that needs to be done and the need that we have in our communities. So for me tonight, it's just kind of going home, just seeing the residents, their stories, and that's what motivates me to continue my work. So um, I'm going to just briefly kind of give you some numbers. I know there are a lot of numbers, but I'll just give you some highlights of what we have been doing for these past three years, which they're all fuzzy. I mean, I see two years, and then it's almost four years, right? So um, I think that is a slideshow for some people that can see. And the first one is the slide on what we have been doing in production. So I'll, there are three areas on my department. One is production, preservation, research, technical assistance for affordable housing. So these past three years, because the governor kept the construction industry open, we were able to complete about 6,800 affordable housing units. That's production and preservation. And we have another uh, 7,500 under different stages of financing, construction, in the pipeline, as we call it developers, we call it a pipeline. So we have a very healthy pipeline. That, um, we utilize about 600 million in the state and federal resources, and that leverage about $3.3 billion in uh, private investments. So we don't do this alone. We work with our um, sister organization, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, and what we have been able to do is actually to pair and align the resources with our resources and bring in more private financing. And uh, the only way that we can do that, because uh, construction is expensive, we have a lot of issues that we had to face. On the technical aspect, uh, we were able to help and assist some of our um, municipalities. Uh, every municipality, for those that don't know, we're supposed to submit a housing plan. Um, and we provided, two years ago, we partnered with the Regional Plan Association to provide a guide and a toolkit so nobody had an, ex an excuse that they didn't know how to do it. So we did that, we uh, put out, also we provided resources, uh, $1.1 $1 million to municipalities. And we have about 85 municipalities that took advantage of that. So today I think we have a little over 100 municipalities that have provided those housing plans. And then uh, through the pandemic, we had um, the, a couple of things that, that we, nobody knew about this pandemic, right? We didn't have a guidebook. Uh, the first initial aspect of my job was, be, besides being the commissioner now, I needed to um, just move towards a different place. And we were able, my first um, task was to move a, a thousand people from shelters to uh, hotels. So we contracted out with uh, several hotels to be able to move, especially the most vulnerable, so that we could stop the spread. And we were able to successfully do that. So we, uh, through the pandemic, we have the emergency resources that we had to, to manage. We received $400 million for rent relief. That's the United City program that we had to basically um, 
settle and, and stand up and hiring people uh, within two, three, um, not even two months. And, and we were, I, w I was very thankful that my staff worked 24 seven to get it done. And we were able to assist so many families we have paid about $320 million to landlords, and we have more than 11,000 landlords that have been benefiting from these resources. And uh, the last number that I saw today, I think it was about a little over 50,000 um, households that has been benefiting from this. We pay electricity, uh, f about $48 million to utility companies, and the rent has been about $242 million. So um, my department is pretty small, <laughs> but you throw those numbers. We, we really have done it because we partnered with organizations like Teams. Teams was one of our organizations, and we have many other. We have volunteers, we have uh, many service organizations, and our sister agencies that have been working with us. That's the only way that we could have been able to do all the work that we did. And then uh, we also manage uh, some federal resources, and especially for the small towns. The CDBG uh, was able to, we were able to uh, allocate about $61 million. And then um, in this region, probably we have about five or $7 million from preservation. Those are for those apartments for elderly uh, that need some uh, uh, renovations and they need, we really do wanna make sure that we take care of the quality of life of everyone. So we wanna make sure that those old buildings are rehabbed. Uh, the, the other thing that we did with, um, well, through the pandemic, we learned a few things, right? I don't know if there is a slide on a McKinney shelter. Oh, they haven't been running the slide. <laughs> So well, it, uh, the McKinney shelter uh, was a shelter in Hartford, and you can see the bunk beds on the top. And then uh, what we decided to do was actually utilize resources from the federal government to provide uh, acquisition funds to one of the um, community agencies in Hartford, CRT. And CRT acquired the building, and they're now doing a commercial kitchen. As you move to the next one, you can see the whole, or I think, that's, that's the, no, before that. So the McKinney shelter now will be, instead of those horrible bunk beds, now you have two people in a bed, in a bedroom. And what CRT is also going to be doing, they're gonna be providing the services in the same uh, space. They're gonna have mental health, substance abuse, medical, and vocational training. So that a person that has some challenges don't have to go and wait or have to look for transportation to be able to go to those appointments. Services will be right there. And that's kind of our new way of looking at shelters, is that we're not doing more shelters. We're trying to provide a little more services within the emergency housing. For me, that's an emergency, right? So we can't just congregate people and then have and ask them to leave during the day and come back at night because nobody's going to be helped in that way. It's how we can provide those resources. So the, there are a couple of pictures there um, just showing Torrington. Um, we we uh, just cut the ribbon for um, a little over 62 units, I think, affordable housing with units for uh, DDS, which is the Devel Developmental um, services with the Department of Devel Developmental Services, 12 units. Uh, we have units that goes from 25% of area median income with somebody making 15,000 a family of four up to market rate. So it's a beautiful unit. And I just wanna show you because some of you sometimes we don't understand what affordable, affordable housing is. They, they think, some people might think, that they're low income and that it's ugly and it's, it's such a beautiful building. It's a luxury apartment, actually. And everybody, I mean, from energy efficient to the way the amenities is by the river, so there are beautiful developments that are affordable and that can really make a difference in somebody's life. There is also a picture of some homeownership. We have been doing homeownership in the state. In Litchfield, uh, Goshen, Connecticut, we have a uh, about 13 units 
that are um, homes for sale. It trusts that the volunteers and the town working together have been able to uh, work with us. We provide the resources and they're building those homes. They're also utilizing for those homes um, some, a new program that thanks to our legislators here and thank you to our governor, uh, in December they passed $20 million from state uh, resources to do the um, Time to Own program, which is a down payment assistance program, up to $50,000 for down payment assistance. It's a forgivable loan, 10 years. It's being forgiven a tenth every year. And by the end of those 10 years, that family has equity into that house. So that's, uh, we, we really want, uh, I love the program. We, have, we are oversubscribed right now. We have about six, uh, 6,500 6, uh, households that are, um, has reserved the, um, the program. So I hope that the governor and the legislators will um, give us a little more support on that because it really has been very successful. And then um, as, just to not to um, continue on because we have so many programs and so many things that we're doing, but I just wanted to um, mention one example. I think David, you asked me if in the past or if I had any example of developments that have been done and how can people get together, how the private sector get together to be able to do more affordable housing. So I'm gonna tell you just a, a, a brief story. Several, several years back, the Harold Wester Smith Foundation that is in Waterbury, for those that don't know, um, they, they approached me when I was the CEO of uh, the nonprofit to work in a neighborhood. The foundation made a multi-year financial commitment to NeighborWorks New Horizons, to the organization. 560,000 the first year, to use 360,000 for the capital, meaning that we could buy properties. And they wanted a specific, it was a street. And if uh, the slideshow goes on, almost the last slides is Gaffney Place. So th those houses were dilapidated. There was um, a street with four or five houses that you couldn't walk, basically, on that street. So they provided a 560,000, 200,000 for operations. And then they committed 150,000 for operations in the second year and 100,000 every year after that for a few more years. So that they really, what they wanted to do, and Jim Smith, the president of the foundation, when he approached me, was like, he wanted to make a difference, but he wanted to make it now. He couldn't wait. And the way why those resources worked was because a, a developer usually has to work and then develop and try to get resources to pay staff. So you always are trying to raise money and raise money, and it takes so long. So with this approach, they, we were able to hire a person to put the projects together, and in three years, we transformed a neighborhood. And it's just an amazing way of putting commitments and also making sure that, oh, and the other part was that they were involved in the development parts, so that every quarter we will meet with them and we'll provide the updates in how uh, far we were in those developments. So there are ways that people can get involved. Uh, the philanthropic group can be involved, the foundations can be involved, providing minimal resources to some of the nonprofits that are doing this work. And um, since I mentioned that program, um, leading by, by example and to increase production, I just committed to five nonprofit developers, 200,000 for operation, and 500,000 for pre-development loan at 0% interest for each of them so that they can start increasing their production and the capacity. So a lot of things going on, right? <laughs> but um, I just wanna tell you that the only way we can address the affordable housing need is working together, aligning our resources, private and public. 
and for towns to take a proactive role, especially now that they are, have developed those plans, is to implement, how do they implement these plans? In my department, we are open to provide technical assistance to any town that may need. So when you are talking to your town, please let them know that the Commissioner of the Department of Housing have resources, have resources for technical assistance, and we have resources for production and for preservation. So, um, to end um, my basically a report because I have like two, four, five, six legislators here. <laughs> so, some of us just need an affordable, healthy, warm place to call home and be able to excel like our friend here, Janelle. But I also have to tell you that, like Janelle, I used to live in a subsidized apartment. I was a single mom. I was going to school full time. I had two jobs, two part-time jobs. And because I had a place that I could afford, I was able to to obtain an associate, a bachelor's, a master, and a fellowship at Harvard University. So we are all in this together. Housing and supportive services. Thank you for all your work, not only to the staff of teams and the board, but the volunteers, the people that come together, the private sector, to help us in this mission because it is a mission but working together i think we can get closer thank you